textbook game theory usually employs a two by two payoff matrix to explain game theory. But these matrices are difficult to follow, and their format unnecessarily restricts the kind of binary choice games that can be explained. For example, a typical payoff matrix for a PD game may look like this, where the number represents cardinal payoff indexes. With high numbers indicating higher payoffs, and L represents the left choice, and R represents the right choice. But the meaning of this payoff matrix is more apparent if we extend it to a multi-party situation of n persons. The number of persons choosing R. Increases from left to right, and the number of persons choosing L increases from right to left. The payoffs for choosing R increases as more people choose R, and the payoff for choosing L decreases as more people choose L. The endpoints of these payoff curves represents the cardinal payoff indexes. The payoff curves assume that each of the person making the same choice has the same average payoffs. Plotted this way, it is very clear that choosing L is the dominant strategy. It is also very easy to plot the collective payoff curve over the distribution of n people over choice L and choice R. The collective payoff is simply the payoff for L weighted by the percentage of people choosing L, plus the payoff for R weighted by the percentage of people choosing R. This collective payoff curve clearly shows that everybody choosing R at A is collectively superior. But because L is the dominant strategy, everybody ends up choosing L at B. This is, of course, the classic prisoner's dilemma game. The advantage of the multi-party format. To analyze binary choice games is even more compelling when the payoff curves intersect each other. For example, in a coordination game, here R dominates L past the intersection point as more people choose R, and L dominates R past the intersection point. As more people choose L, in other words, people prefer to be with the majority, regardless of what the option might be. So the payoff for R goes up when more people are choosing R, and the payoff for L also goes up. As more people are choosing L, let us generate the collective payoff curve by computing the weighted average of the two payoffs. Here we have two equilibrium solutions. Everyone choosing R is stable on the right at A. And everybody choosing L is stable on the left at B. If the top payoff on the right is the same as the top payoff on the left, people should be indifferent between all choosing R at A and all choosing L at B. But if the top payoff on one side is much lower than the other side, Choosing the wrong side might get everybody trapped in a stable, 
but collectively inferior equilibrium, such as B, because at B there is no incentive to defect from L, since L dominates R. For example, having a unified measurement system is definitely better than having many competing systems. But one unified measurement system may be superior to other measurement systems. The choice between the American and the metric systems of measurement comes to mind. Due to congestion, the payoff declines for R as more people are choosing R. The same for L. Simultaneously, the payoff for L increases as more people choose R due to relief of congestion on L and vice versa. The strategic behavior is to do the opposite of what most other people do. When the payoff curves for R and L are symmetrical, the collective payoff curve shows that the collectively superior and stable solution occurs at the intersection. But if the payoff curves are not symmetrical, the collectively optimal solution is somewhere to the right or left of the intersection point. But uncoordinated pursuit of self-interest will ensure that this optimum is not reached. Instead, the stable equilibrium occurs at the intersection point B. The choice between staying home and going out after a snowstorm is an example of such a congestion game. Those who stay home benefit those driving on the road and vice versa.